Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Yogic Studies Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Powell, and this is episode 15. Today, we'll be speaking with Dr. Mark Singleton. This was a pretty big episode for me. Mark's work has been tremendously influential in the field of yoga studies and has greatly inspired my own work and aspirations to go on to grad school and to carry out this type of research. Mark's work has also been heavily criticized, uh, controversial, and I would say quite misunderstood. So it was great to take the time to sit down with Mark and talk to him about his journey in yoga and academia and reflect upon his research and its impact. I'm also excited to announce that Mark will be offering an online course for us here at Yogic Studies entitled YS113, Yoga's Past, Present, and Future. This will be our first offering of the new year, 2021. The course runs live from January 4th through the 29th, and enrollment will open on December 21st. We hope that you'll consider joining us for this exciting and unprecedented opportunity to study directly with Mark Singleton who sadly, as you'll hear at the end of this episode, has recently announced his retirement from the field. Mark Singleton's research interests lie in the intersection of tradition and modernity in yoga. He was research assistant to Dr. Elizabeth de Michaelis at Cambridge University's Dharam Hinduja Institute of Indic Research in 2002 through 3 he went on to complete a PhD at Cambridge's Faculty of Divinity on the modern history of yoga. He taught undergraduate and postgraduate courses at St. John's College in Santa Fe, New Mexico between 2006 and 13. His numerous books include Yoga in the Modern World, Rutledge 2008, edited with Jean Byrne, Yoga Body, The Origins of Modern Posture Practice, Oxford University Press 2010, which we focus on heavily in this episode, Gurus of Modern Yoga, Oxford University Press 2014, edited with Ellen Goldberg, and Roots of Yoga, Penguin Classics, published recently in 2017 with James Mallinson. He's also written numerous articles, book chapters, and encyclopedia entries on yoga. As listeners will know, uh, Mark has been working on what is the now concluding five-year Hatha Yoga project. His work focused primarily on the history of physical practices that were incorporated into or associated with yoga in pre-colonial India. Mark is involved in the critical editing of three of the project's core texts, the Yoga Chintamani, Hatha Sanketa Chandrika, and the Hatha Abhyasa Parati. He's also writing a new monograph on the subject of yoga and technology, which we talk about briefly at the end of this episode. All right, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark Singleton. All right, I am here with Mark Singleton. Mark, welcome to the Yogic Studies podcast. It's really a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you very much, Seth. It's a pleasure to be here. And where are you tuning in right now for our our listeners? I am speaking from uh, the northwest of Spain in Galicia. Mm. Oh, and you've you've recently relocated there? Yeah, I I bought a house here a couple of years ago, and I'm living here full time now. And uh, it's right on the Atlantic coast and a very beautiful spot. and uh, yeah, this this is where I'm operating from, and where I am, you know, in these in these times of COVID and and uh, restricted travel. This is where I'm I'm mostly based at the moment. Mm, yeah, and not to get into all of that too much, but just to acknowledge it's you know it's a it's an incredibly strange and difficult time. Um, but I'm all the more appreciative uh, of your time and to get to have these conversations right now. Um, and uh, it's it's really an honor to have you here, Mark. Um, I, I've been looking forward to this conversation for, for some time and the opportunity to get to talk to you about your uh, truly groundbreaking and, and influential scholarship. Um, we, we've got a lot to discuss today and uh, somewhat limited time frame today. Um, you know, some things I want to get into is, uh, of course, your, your monograph, Yoga Body, 
uh, which has been incredibly influential in the field of yoga studies and beyond. Uh, I want to talk about your more recent work uh, on roots of yoga and this recently concluded Hatha Yoga project coming to the end of five years here. Mm -hmm. And then some of your, your, your current work that, that you've been doing. But um, before we get into all of the research and the scholarship, I think it might be helpful for listeners uh, and even for myself to, to just hear a little bit about your story and how did you come into yoga and then into academia and how did you end up you know, doing a PhD um, on yoga? Yeah. Well, thanks very much, Seth. Um, it's, it's really great to be talking to you about this. And we, we've had conversations around these topics over the years as we've, uh, our paths have crossed on the, on the kind of academic circuit. Mm. Um, I started off studying yoga practically, um, or I guess about 25 years ago, or a little bit longer. Um, <clears throat> and really sort of quite quickly getting into the kind of academic study of it. And I think it's a it's sort of a predisposition. I'm, I'm sort of, you know, um, conditioned to, to look at things that way in some way. And um, I as uh, came as a practitioner who, who had spent quite a, quite a lot of time in India already. I'd been there for, I'd been studying yoga, trying to sort of discover more about yoga in India um, for about three years. And then when I when I came back to the UK, I happened upon an institute in Cambridge where I was um, I was studying, where I had studied, where I'd done a, a master's, and what was actually um, part way into an, a different PhD. Mm. Um, I discovered this institute called the Dharam Hinduja Institute of Indic Studies mm. um, that was headed by um, Elizabeth, Elizabeth de Michaelis, who of course, was one of the sort of pioneers of this study of modern yoga. And um, <clears throat> when I heard what Elizabeth was doing and what, what the rest of the, the people working there were doing, I thought that's really what I want to do. That seems to answer so many of the questions that I had as a practitioner who'd been exposed to lots of different yoga, uh, you know, different forms of yoga up until that point, both in the UK, also in France, in the, in the United States to some, uh, to some extent, and, and also during those years in India, you know, really going, I was, I was going far afield, trying to find out everything I could. Mm -hmm. And um, you were even you so were teaching yoga at that time too, is that right? I was teaching yoga at that time, yes. Yes. And, were, and uh, were you mm -hmm. were you affiliated at that time, at least with a particular school or, or lineage of modern yoga? Yeah, I did. I did two teacher trainings. I, I did a, a teacher training first in the Satyananda school. So the, the Bihar school of yoga, which is quite well known and one of the, the possibly the biggest um, teacher training school in northern India. So I, I, I was there in northern India and I also did some training in their in their southern branch and then qualified as a teacher in, in that. And then after that, I did a um, an Iyengar teacher training. So the, the teachings of BKS Iyengar mm -hmm. um, that are also very well known and sort of foundational for for popular yoga practice, let's say, in, in the wider world. So, yes, I, I was uh, I was a yoga teacher. Mm. And then your experiences both in India and in the UK as a practitioner, as a teacher, they were starting to, I think like many of us who kind of have, a, you know, I myself have a, have a very similar story, right, of kind of coming up in that practitioner environment and then starting to read some of the extant literature and scholarship available at the time and all of these questions starting to mount about where all of this stuff is actually coming from, right? And Exactly. You, so you had already simultaneously started your academic training doing a master's and then you discovered the work that Elizabeth Day Michaelis was doing at Cambridge and had a sense that you wanted to go on for doctoral studies? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I started out as a researcher. I was, you know, researching in that institute, um, modern yoga, um, yeah, the history of modern yoga. And it's funny, you know, now after sort of what 15 or 16 years or 17 years later in fact my god how quickly time goes you know if we if we think back to those times there really wasn't 
um, uh, an understanding. There wasn't even a sort of a, you know, a sense of that there was a thing called modern yoga. It, you know, it remained to be theorized, it remained to be worked out. So it was very much the beginning of, of, uh, of this field of inquiry that we now see burgeoning and, and blossoming and you know lots of people now sort of involved in in working out this history this more recent history of yoga so i i did a year as um, a, a year of research working there as a as a paid researcher within this institute and then i decided to to go on and, and do um do a phd in uh in the history of yoga, in the modern history of yoga, building on, in some respects, the work of um, Elizabeth de Michaelis and also of Joseph Alter in the United States, who were two of the, the key early pioneers of, of this study and who, who brought this, these phenomena that we sort of group under this, this umbrella term, modern yoga, into, into focus for the first time. Because I think for various reasons that, that you'll know, um, it had been hidden and sort of sidelined, very much sidelined in favor of the study of, um, you know, so-called classical yoga, the more serious yoga. Mm -hmm. And practical yoga wasn't deemed a serious object of study. So at the time, it was, it was quite new. It was quite cutting edge. Now, of course, it's much better known, but that's that's how I got into it. That's how I, I you know, I began this uh, this this kind of journey of uh, investigation that's still ongoing. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting to reflect back on that time, maybe early two thousands, um, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and now where we're at today. Um, and there's all, there's a lot of things I think that we sort of just take for granted about what we know about yoga's past and present and, and all of this. But at this time that you're talking about, there was so little that had actually been charted critically. Um, and you mentioned the work of Elizabeth de Michaelis and Joseph Alter. I think around 2004, five, they both had these books that were published. I think there was a couple other works that came out at that time as well. That that strikes me as like a big watershed moment for modern yoga. And yeah, then, of that. course, your work as kind of continuing that and pushing uh, the conversation and discourse further. So talk a little bit about, and I, I don't think everybody realizes that your book, uh, Yoga Body, which was published in 2010, so we're now actually, uh, this is, I guess, the 10th year anniversary of that book, believe it or not. Yeah, uh, yeah coming into the 11th year now. People might not realize that that, that book came out of your dissertation proce uh, project um, and how it kind of, uh, talk a little bit about how the project developed and how it builds on and relates to your thesis advisor, Elizabeth Day Michaelis's pioneering work. Sure. So the, the book came about, um, well, the, the PhD came about, as I say, as a result of what was initially a very um, um, sort of broad inquiry into all the expressions of, uh, of yoga that, that we could find, really, in, in the sort of modern sense, or as the, in yoga practice that was somehow outside of the traditional environments of yoga practice, let's say ascetic culture within India, um, or more quote unquote traditional forms of yoga practice. So yoga practice often taught in the English language, um, yoga forms that had traveled around the world and that were you know, known outside of, of those traditional contexts. So I, I began with um, quite a sort of widespread and, and quite wide-ranging study of everything that we could find. We were gathering material as, you know, within this institute as part of this modern yoga research project. Um, Elizabeth de Michaelis's book, um, Yoga in, um, 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 her, her, her book, modern yoga. Sorry, yeah, thank you very much. I was getting confused with uh, with Joseph Walter's book, Yoga in Modern India, which I, I sort of associate the two because I read them both at the same time in um, in manuscript form. You know, I was very lucky to be sort of, you know, to be able to sort of see this research as it, as it sort of developed. And what she was doing was studying in particular the work of Vivekananda, who, as we know, was one of the real pioneers of yoga, who took yoga and taught it for the first time as a kind of practice that was available 
for the uninitiated and for people outside of India. And, you know, he was doing this mostly in, in you know, in the United States. <clears throat> and what, what she suggested was that the way that Vivekananda taught was very much influenced by factors that you might call, again, non-traditional. That's to say, European philosophy, European ideas about science and psychology, crucially, you know, Vivekananda was very sort of connected with um, um, William James. Um, she also spoke uh, and wrote extensively about the esoteric uh, tradition into which um, Vivekananda was, um, in, in which he, he was very much involved during his time in the United States. And the result of that, which was a very particular vision of yoga um, for, um, for Americans, essentially. You know, the, these, uh, these books, particularly Raja Yoga, published in 1896, became a kind of blueprint, she argued, uh, Elizabeth argued, for the experiments in yoga that would then follow. And so what, what you know, her, her basic argument was that this was in some respects a rupture, even though it's a continuation with tradition, it's an outgrowth of the of the larger yoga tradition. It's also, in some senses, new, insofar as it brings in all these other elements, these cultural and intellectual and philosophical, psychological elements into its teaching. Mm. And so, as a result of that, um, as a result of that study, she came up with a, a typology, which which sort of. Um, forms the, the the core of the thesis, I think, of uh, different kinds of yoga, mm -hmm. and um, one of these I won't, I won't go through the typology, but one of these she called modern postural yoga, which right. is to say those practices that we're so familiar with today, um, and that are based on the practice of asana. So, um, in the end, what I did uh, through through the PhD was to focus on on this aspect it wasn't originally it wasn't supposed to be the 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 only aspect but it proved to be uh, sufficiently rich for uh, you know to sort of um provide for the material for analysis for for a phd so that's what i that's what i focused on was the culture of asana as it emerged and as it developed both within india in the 19th and 20th century and also around the world so how asana was understood, how asana was practiced, how asana in, in the modern, in, in this sort of modern context was ref reflected back older traditions of asana, older traditions of yoga, but also reflected these new influences from um, different disciplines of body, body culture, you might say, like phys the worldwide physical culture movement which was sort of exploding around the world in, in the 19th century into the 20th century, like um, um, sort of body work within a, within a psychotherapeutic framework, um, like um, what I call in the book, harmonial gymnastics, like the, these kinds of um, what I think of as independent traditions of, um, <clears throat> of body-centered, um, spirituality, so accessing uh, the you know spiritual realms through the body that have nothing in it seems to me in the first instance really to do with yoga, but um, you know subsequently do start to mix and merge with with yoga. So really the you know the the thesis was is sort of a you know and and the book it's a cultural history of these understandings of the body and of the understandings and development of yoga that emerge as a result of this um, intermixing of, um, of all, these, all these different factors. So it's trying to describe really that, you know, like what it is, why it is that today yoga is popularly often identified with asana practice rather than with meditation, let's say, or with pranayama practice, with the, you know, the breath control practices, which at different times and, you know, within, uh, Indian tradition have, have really been at, at the at the core and the center of uh, of, of practice. Right. So that, yes. in a nutshell, that's what I was doing. Because Elizabeth de Michaelis's work kind of brilliantly identified the late 19th century uh, folks like Vivek, Swami Vivekananda, 
and others from the Arya and Brahmo Samaj in India, part of this kind of Indian Renaissance, Hindu Renaissance, as kind of a birthing moment for what she calls modern yoga, right? Yeah. But but her, and, and then she introduces this typology of different types of modern yoga, including, as you said, she coins this term modern postural yoga, which is now got an acronym. I mean, people refer to it as MPY, and uh, it's something you hear even in modern yoga discourse. Um, so it's important to understand where that where that comes from. But I think what her book didn't do and where your work, as I see it, picks up is her book did not explain why if Vivekananda kind of marks the origins or birthing moment of modern yoga, and yet he didn't really teach postures or asana. Uh, yeah. And in fact, as your, as your book shows, he actually had a particular disdain for asana, or at least for hatha yoga, that he's actually quite clear about in some of his writings. And so what then accounts for this focus, this central emphasis on asana, on posture, that as you say, today, now when somebody even thinks of the word yoga, they associate it with physical posturing and stretching. So what accounted for, you know, um, this, this huge change if the origins of modern yoga were more focused on a meditational yoga, the Raja yoga for Vivekananda in his interpretation of Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, where, where did this explosion of interest in, in asana come from, right? So I, I, I see that, am I right? That was, like an, that was kind of an important intervention that, that you were trying to make at that time. Yes, yes, that's right. I mean, uh, let's, I mean it's perhaps worth um, considering first why Vivekananda didn't include asana, because asanas are there in the Indian tradition and, you know, um, um, have always been there with different purposes. You know, the very early asanas, of course, are about about sitting down and uh, staying put. Then in, in Hatha Yoga, they start to be put to um, to different uses, to have different purposes, to become more complex and more numerous. But so, as you say, in, in these first years of this yoga renaissance, as it's been called, um, Vivekananda and most of those who followed him didn't really put an emphasis on um, on arson. It wasn't there. And yes, he he. Some of his statements seem to suggest a kind of disdain, not just for asana, but also for hatha yoga, hatha yoga more generally. So the question is, why why is this? And Vivekananda is a really complex figure. Like you know, so he 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 speaks out against hatha yoga. Um, but, and he says, you know, life is short, Hatha Yoga takes a long time, you may as well actually just do, go straight, straight to the heart of the matter and do a spiritual yoga, and that's, you know, where he, he sort of gets his ideas about Raja Yoga from. But if you look at his book, Raja Yoga, in fact, he's borrowing so much of the apparatus from Hatha Yoga that you sort of, you sort of wonder, you know, he's, so he's a contradiction in many ways. But I think and the the case that I made in in the book and in in the in the PhD was that um, his he he's kind of inherited a distrust a sort of cultural distrust of the yogi that's to say the the hatha yogi um, who had been presented um, in in sort of the ethnography of the time, in the scholarship of the time, Western scholarship, but also, you know, it exists within within the Indian culture as well, of the Hatha Yogi as an outsider of, of that, you know, this this sort of traditional practitioner of asana, etc., um, as somebody who is uncivilized or outside the pale of proper, um, you know, sort, sort of um, respectable society, let's say, and th there are many examples of the presentation of, um, of of these yogis in postcards, in photography, in journals, where it's clear, you know, that, that they're, they're simply not respected. And I think the case that I made was that Vivekananda was reacting to that, that he needed to sort of clean things up for his presentation of yoga. And of course, He's gone to the um, United States as an ambassador for Hinduism, for India, and also in, in, you know, in later years for yoga itself. So he's trying to present something 
um, that's apart from this um, this sort of image of yoga as as magic, as involving drugs, possibly involving illicit sex. You know, all, all these sorts of um, dark and salacious elements that um, that people looking into India love to see, you know, and to present as this sort of strange religious life of India. Well, he's trying to he's trying to clean things up and present something that is acceptable and that can be practiced by respectable people. And so um, I think in, in some in some respects that that's part of that's one half of the answer of, of, of why um, asana isn't strongly present in this first in this first sort of um, renaissance of this first wave of the renaissance of yoga starting with him um but maybe just uh, before i get into the second part just to say that you know another contradiction is that vivekananda had a training in hatha yoga mm. with a guru called pavari baba like um we it's well known that that his um that his guru was rama krishna the 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 great saint the you know really famous um, saint of India, Ramakrishna, mm -hmm. but also, you know, he he did actually an apprenticeship with Papari Baba, and it's a sort of story that I that I recount in the book, where he learns Hatha Yoga. So he knew he knew some of this, he knew what it was. Mm -hmm. But I think what he's doing is trying to present, um, you know, something that's that's cleaned up and acceptable for a larger audience. Let's say right, because he's very much a product of his time. He's, as you said, he's presenting not only yoga but vedanta and hinduism in the english language on the kind of global stage if you think of the world parliament of religions in 1893 yeah. coming out, yeah. you know out of india he, he he's a he's an emissary he's a missionary for all of this and so he has to present himself in a certain very posh very elite um and in a language right that's on par with other world religions like Christianity and in particular Protestantism. And so he's, That's right. he's in some ways, as you say, kind of cleaning up certain things from maybe Tantra or Hatha Yoga or things that at that time maybe were deemed um, impure to certain uh, elite sensibilities at that time. Is that right? That's that's absolutely right. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's the motivation that that we're seeing here, and of, of course, you know, as you say, that this the the World Parliament of Religions was was a gathering that that he turned up at in 1893 in Chicago, um, in order to um, bring together the, the the world religions, you know, for the first time, all in the same venue from from uh, many different cultures, and he presented himself as the represent as the representative of Hinduism alongside, you know, the Christian, the, you know, the, the Christian delegates, Buddhist delegates. And, and so the, there was something, there was a kind of challenge here, which was to present um, Hinduism as a world religion, not just on a par with these other religions, but in fact, better than them in some ways, you know, that in, so it, instead of the the common idea at the time and sort of perhaps the idea in the minds of the conveners of, of this parliament um in fact you know in in um in vivekananda's work it's actually hinduism not christianity that's the flower of of uh of world religion so yeah there's a lot riding on this mm. he really you know i think he really feels himself to be an ambassador and so he has to be careful because of all this um well, to put it colloquially, bad mouthing of of hatha yoga and bad mouthing of um, of Hinduism more generally, in fact. So yeah, that's that's certainly going on. Yeah, and I think chapters two and three of Yoga Body really spell out this particular historical moment and context that Vivekananda is kind of operating in. It's just so clearly. I think these chapters still, for me, just really hold up as just really important work of kind of documenting that period for the um, both Indian and European elites and shaping their thinking about these topics. Mm -hmm. So what's, so if that's wh where Vivekananda kind of lands, and even if he had a maybe lesser known Hatha Yoga Guru, but still in his public presentations and in his writings, he's, he's not emphasizing postural yoga in the way that, you know, that, that we now know of it. Right. So, 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 Something changes dramatically to get to the kind of post-World War II 
uh, you know, postural yoga boom and the teachings of, um, you know, so many of the modern schools of yoga from BKS Iyengar and the Jirumalai Krishnamacharya lineages to Shivananda, the Satyananda schools, as we were discussing, um, so on and so forth. There's such a huge gap, right, between what Vivekananda was teaching and writing about and then what we what we got later. And so uh, your book, right, if uh, you know, uh, really helps to explain this shifting emphasis and the centering of the body and and postural yoga. Um, so what is what are some of the main arguments that you make in yoga body? And what's kind of the evidence and materials that you're looking at uh, to make those arguments? Yeah, so again, it's it's a cultural history of the body in some way. It's a cultural history of the, of, of the body in yoga. And um, that, that's what I'm talking about when, you know, when I say the yoga body, it's this sort of um, conception of of what it is to practice yoga physically and how that conception might change between um, contexts of um, of the ancient past or traditional contexts in India and, and what it might be in in the uh, in the more recent uh, past in the 20th century in different context in different countries let's say so let's just go back to Vivekananda for for a moment I think the impact of Vivekananda as a in presenting yoga and in his various books on yoga I mean he wasn't he was much more than a yoga teacher in fact the you know his role of a yoga teacher sort of began and end in the, ended in the United States in some respects with with these uh, with these books that he wrote and with the teaching that he did there. He was he was many other things. So if you look at his collected works, not much of it is about yoga. In fact, um, you know he, he's a much broader character than that. Um, but this the effect that his teachings had on um, what, what, what I call um, transnational Anglophone yoga, it's a bit of a mouthful. Mm. And, um, it, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of formulation that, that, can, be, uh, that can be picked apart. But I, I think, you know, in the sense that um, yoga teaching in English after Vivekananda that traveled around the world, almost always, owes a debt to him. So when we start to see the introduction of, of these um, physical practices um, by the likes of um, the most, you know, some of the most famous gurus of the time would have been Swami Puvalayananda with his um, center of study in Kaivalya Dham in Lonavla near Pune in, um, in Maharashtra in India, and um, Yogendra in, with his earliest modern yoga institute in Santa Cruz, in um, also in southern India, where, where they're both um, <clears throat> they're, they're, they're both presenting something quite new. They're, they're, they're reworking the traditional asana. Um, the, the the traditions of asana within India along very different lines, and I'll go into that in a moment. But they're also, I think, they and many of the other innovators that that kind of ride in in the wake of Vivekananda's great revolution are basing themselves in the logic and the teachings of Vivekananda. So the postural element that comes in is not seen as a, as a kind of break with that. It's, a seen, it's seen as a deepening and a uh, continuation, notwithstanding, of course, you know, Vivekananda's own uh, comments about asanas and how useless they are. Um, <clears throat> and I think there's, there's various reasons for this. One is that um, we have a vibrant um, sort of, you know, um, history of practice of, of um, asana practice within the Indian tradition which is which is there and which is um, you know can be drawn upon and this was a period of um, and now I'm talking about sort of the last half of the 19th century going back a bit mm -hmm. before this next great wave let's say the you know the hatha yoga renaissance in in the broader world what what we see is a great interest in physical culture generally speaking and this is so one of the arguments that I'm making in in the book is that there's there was a, a a worldwide revolution in physical culture, often associated with nation states, emerging nation states, and with nationalism, that worked along the logic 
that to have a strong nation, you had to have strong individuals. To have a strong state, you had to have strong individual bodies. And so this, this sort of notion kicked off a kind of um, huge enthusiasm for physical culture all the way around the world, starting in Europe um, and spreading out you know, through India all the way to Japan, all the way around the world to Mao's China and so on. Um, <clears throat> So we have, we, we have this kind of culture emerging. And in India, you see something um, quite similar happening. Uh, you see a, a revival of traditional forms of physical disciplines, including martial arts, like fighting with, with a lati, with a, with a stick, including some Southern Indian martial arts, um, uh, including wrestling exercises, and um, certain weightlifting um, exercises from within wrestling and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. But crucially, one of these elements is yoga, is, is yogasana. One of the elements that, that can be fitted into this new um, uh, enthusiasm, let's say, for, um, for physical culture. And so what we see happening during that time is a kind of mixing because India is open and opening to, through, to, the, to the wider world, because of the encounter with colonialism, because, because of the presence of, of uh, the, the British occupation of India over, over you know, a couple of centuries, there's a kind of, there's a kind of opening. So the, the possibility to learn about physical culture in a, in a global sense is suddenly there through, um, through cheap um, reproductions of, um, of books with drawings or photographs through um, magazines. There are lots of those. And suddenly you start to have this global community of um, physical culture practitioners. And within India, one of the things that they um, are keen to represent is the wider yoga tradition. And in that way, you start to see asana becoming more visible um, as, as a practice in itself and as part and parcel of a broader sort of um, body of knowledge that, that's, um, you know, of, of physical culture. Mm. So that in, in a nutshell, uh, is, you know, that's the argument that I made, that asana came onto the world stage as part of a sort of a broader cultural movement that wasn't purely about yoga. Mm. So, so the thesis turned book, Yoga Body, as we said, it's published in 2010. So we're now, you know, in the, in the 11th year, as we said, uh, anniversary of the publication of this book. Since its publication, uh, it, th this book has had tremendous uh, shelf life and influence, I would say, in, in numerous ways, you know, certainly within the academic fields of religious studies, South Asian studies, and now what we can call yoga studies. Uh, I think your book, uh, again, building on earlier scholarship, but your book in particular has had a huge influence on this burgeoning field of yoga studies and has influenced and inspired lots of generations of younger scholars, including myself. Uh, reading this book was, was, was a game changer, really, for me and my understanding of, uh, of, of all of what we're talking about. Um, outside of academia, though, this book has been widely read and purchased and received, more so typically than other academic monographs of dissertations turned books. Uh, no surprise, I think, given a topic and the public interest in yoga and the tens of millions of practitioners and teachers of yoga around the world. Um, and in many ways, you know, this book, as the, um, as the blurb on the back of it uh, playfully says, Yoga Body turns conventional wisdom about yoga on its head. Um, so I think, as you, as you well know, this book has been both uh, positively received, and has also been very heavily criticized, and I would say also very misunderstood. And there's a, a wide range of receptions that this book has, has garnered, uh, especially in more public and uh, more yoga practitioner spaces. Um, can you talk a little bit about the reception of this book and what... Are, <laughs> 
I, I, I hate to put this on you, but what are some of the things that you think that people are getting wrong about the book based on some of the, the feedback and criticism that you've received over the past 10 years? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, yeah, thanks very much, Seth. <laughs> um, it's, <laughs> it's, um, it, it has been, a, it has been a, um, a, an interesting process. Yeah. And um, um, when it was, <clears throat> when it was published in 2010, um, uh, you know, I think a, a lot of this stuff was was quite new. A lot of the conversation was quite new, and it came in in the wake of perhaps of conversations about the history of yoga that that um, that in some respects were, were were not accurate according according to me. So I, I knew. Um, that that there was going to be some some kind of uh, controversy. At least I was working against the grain in some way. Um, so if we if we're talking outside of academia, I mean it's it's been a, a you know a great privilege. I'm, I'm you know tremendously happy that the book has been read outside of the academic world as well as inside. You know some of the other books that I've um, edited or um, written. You know they they tend to be. Um, only read by by that that small world, which you know, which you, you also know very well. Um, the misunderstandings. It's it has been sort of commonly understood that what I'm what I'm saying in the book is that yoga, and in particular asana, but sometimes it's extended to yoga, um, is a recent invention. Mm. That actually, what I'm doing is denying the thousand the, you know the thousands of years of yoga tradition within india and what i'm doing is claiming that yoga was invented uh, not just recently but outside of india and mm -hmm. um, you know that <laughs> that it that it was invented by uh, you know that it came from scandinavian gymnastics is is one one of the uh, one of the allegations um one of the misunderstandings that's uh, that's made you know about the book um another one is that i'm saying that yoga is simply about asana or about keep fit or something like that or about gymnastics so it's it's that sort of idea so it, the, the misunderstanding comes from um thinking that what I'm doing is claiming something about the origins of yoga rather than trying to paint a picture of a particular period of time where uh, and, and a particular cultural history where yoga does change um, because it seems to me undeniable e even from you know sort of w within the staunchest traditionalist point of view to see that that yoga traditions and yoga has historical moments mm. that there's yogas you know within within shaiva tantra there's also you know the, there's there's um i don't know there's there's buddhist yoga there's there's hatha yoga and that somehow what we see here are, are different phases of yoga history that there always is change within yoga so to describe this particular change as i do this particular change which is perhaps faster and more wide-ranging and more radical than some of the earlier changes because it's you know opening yoga to the whole world and to describe this cultural confluence and this cultural intermixture um is is really just that it, it doesn't have anything to do with the origins of yoga or yoga per se it's you know it's it's describing this this uh this situation um that that we that we find so i think that that's been that's been the most difficult thing to explain it seems to me a very simple idea but um i i suspect sometimes that the book serves quite um conveniently as a as a straw man it, that's to say um it's useful for for some people to argue that um to to use the book as a kind of target in in order to say you know to sort of say that you know that this this is all nonsense and this and and then for for that for that same person to present what yoga really is um so it's useful i think and that's that's why perhaps sometimes the uh you know the, the book has been misinterpreted because it, it sort of it it gives you something to rail against and then to you know to state your opinion but I, I don't know, you know, even sort of 10, 11 years later, it seems to me that the 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 thesis is fairly incontrovertible or at least 
uh, at least the picture that it describes is one worth considering and worth looking at, even if you know the you might disagree with with the conclusions, which I, I think are tentative. Um, even if um, you know now 10, 11 years later, there's there's more information. The contexts have grown. All right. So the, the PhD was called the context of yoga in the modern age. It was it was about um, you know it was all about context rather than origins. Um, right. So Didn't the the book editors at uh, Oxford University Press they 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 really they made you change the title. Is that right? Yeah, they didn't like the title, so it was um, uh, it was called. Um, was it the body at the center? Is that the body at the center? Of course, yes, yes. It was called. Thank you very much. I'm forgetting titles tonight. It's, okay. it's called the body at the center. Context of modern. Be expected culture. to remember your own <laughs> titles. <laughs> It's been a long time. It's been a long time. Yeah. yeah. So, so it wasn't. It wasn't a very sexy title, and it, it, it sort of. But it was a more exact title. So, I, I don't know if that if that's what you were you were sort of referring to. These, yeah, these I think of... so. I think. Um, I think you hit it on the nail on the head. I, I would say, the most common misunderstanding of the book and the way I see it targeted and criticized, uh, in various yoga circles. And oftentimes when I hear this, I get the sense that the person who is issuing that criticism actually has not read the book very closely, but they've heard somebody talk about it or they read a blog piece about it or, or whatever. I don't know who reads blogs anymore, but um, it, the, the, the idea that you are saying that yoga or asana was invented in the modern period and moreover that the origins of it, of that invention, are non-Indic sources, that they come from Swedish gymnastics or the YMCA, and that there's this causal link and origins uh, that they seem to think that you're claiming, which in many places in the book, you're, you're quite careful to dispel that that's not the work that you're doing. Rather, you're trying to show these contexts and perhaps conceptual parallels between Indian Hatha yoga and modern postural yoga and some of these other physical cultural systems. However, I will say, you know, when you, you flip open the book and you look at, um, you know, you have these incredible images in the book. I mean, some of the archival images that you were able to, to gather from these uh, English language manuals and primers are, are just incredible. You have these, um, these uh, black and white uh, stills the montage from Thomas Dwight's Anatomy of a Contortionist, 1889. And then you have those contrasted with these asanas from BKS Iyengar's Light on Yoga. And they look like almost virtually identical bodily postures, right? And because Dwight's is of European origin, or was he, was Thomas Dwight American? I forget, correct me if I'm American. Yeah, I American, so. but 1889. And then, of course, Iyengar's Light on Yoga, 1966. The, the way the images are stacked next to each other, it might appear as if the author of this book is suggesting this one came first, therefore the, uh, this one came from that. But if you read the, you know, the text that accompanies it, uh, you're clear to point out you're not making any causal link between these postures, but to show these strong associations but tell us, I mean, a little bit more about that. What what are you really saying here? What what are we to make then of these strong associations, even with some of the very specific shapes of these yoga postures that we can detect in modern postural yoga, that we see with some earlier kind of American or European uh, physical, cultural, contortionist or gymnastic uh, programs? Yeah. Um, you, you know, at, at the end of the PhD, I, I had an idea, you know, that the next project that I wanted to do that I never did was to actually do a, a cultural history of contortionism within, you know, um, well, sort of in the United, in North America and, and Europe principally, but perhaps sort of further afield mm. to actually see, you know, was there something more to contortionism than simply this display that we see, you know, in this in this article? Um, from from 1889. Um, so I, you know the contortionism is interesting to look at these days because when when you see something like that as a yoga practitioner, 
you think, ah, that's yoga, how odd, you know, there's somebody doing yoga, it doesn't seem to be called yoga, but obviously it must be related somehow, but I don't think so, and as I say, I haven't really done deep research into this, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's related, it, it is a sort of display culture, it's an entertainment uh, culture, um, and what, what it what it points to, I think, is the limitations of the body and also the, the limitations in the particular movements that the body can do. There's only so many, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's quite a lot if we look at the sort of the range of things you can do in yoga or in contortionism. But those are two different worlds. So the, the, the point here really is that what we have is a kind of palimpsest or if, if you take a piece of tracing paper and you trace over, you trace the same shapes of, of this contortionist from this magazine in, in 1889. And you know, you, you overlay them onto these, these pictures of BKS Iyengar or whoever it might be doing what are yoga postures um, that, that have precedence in the Indian tradition. You put one piece of paper on top of the other and those line drawings match up completely. They are identical. Uh, th there's a few differences, like the positions of the hands that BKS Anger often has the hands in, in a prayer pose, and the contortionist does not, but they look identical. Now, what's interesting, and um, what's really the, the key, what this whole um, project of research is about, is to understand the difference beyond the mere appearance. So what is it that this contortionist thinks that he's doing mm. and compared to what is it that, that BKS Iyengar thinks that he's doing in these postures and obviously he thinks that he's he's doing yoga he knows that he's doing yoga because he's he's a yogi um, so what I was interested in in is is the addition of cultural meaning onto shapes and onto practices that to outward um, to outward um, perception might appear identical but that aren't because they, they carry a kind of baggage, a kind of cargo of cultural meaning. So, uh, you know, another example um, might be, well, uh, you know, an easy example um, would be yoga, yoga's keep fit. You know, what, one of the sort of the adaptations of yoga's keep fit, um, where you do particular postures that are obviously inspired by yoga that come from um, yogic traditions, but that arguably have very little to do with the sorts of the same postures performed in a um, traditional context at the end of the Kumbha Mela, um, uh, you know, one of those great gatherings of sadhus in, in India, where also postural practice is, is key. So if, if you were to, you know, cut out a picture of, of that, of that sort of, you know, keep fit yoga and put them with, you know, in the context of this traditional ascetic yoga, you have the appearance of the same thing, but you have very, very different experiences and realities being lived out in both contexts. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for explaining that, that further. So, I mean, in, in the 10 years, 11 years since the publication of this, uh, it's not as if uh, you quit or stopped researching or working. Uh, I think there's also sometimes the understanding that a book like this is, is sort of the final say on anything like this, but actually in some ways for you, it was sort of marked the beginning of your explorations and research as the culmination of your dissertation project. Since then, you've gone on to publish several different books, edited volumes, and more recently, uh, your collaborations with Jim Mallinson on Roots of Yoga, and then most recently, this incredible five-year Hatha Yoga project with Jim, with Jason Birch, Daniela Bevilacqua, and other scholars in India. Um, as this five-year project comes to an end, and uh, in, in kind of thinking back to, to Yoga Body, I mean, there's been this huge outpouring of research that has taken place since the publication of Yoga Body. Um, we've learned so much about actually the history of asana, among other things. Um, we've got, we, there's been so much more uh, data from unpublished manuscripts, sculptures, uh, paintings, you name it, that has come, come to light that simply was not even available at your disposal at the time of writing the book. Um, what are what are some things, if any, you know, are, how, how have your views 
shifted at all, uh, if, if at all, um, since the writing of Yoga Body in terms of, let me put it more specifically, in terms of the connections between modern postural yoga or, or transnational Anglophone yoga and so-called pre-modern yogas, particularly let's kind of focus on, on asanas. Sure. No, as, as you say, that there has been, you know, a, a great outpouring of work. It, it seems like there's a we're in a kind of heyday of yoga studies. There's so much work being done, and um, particularly based on um, textual evidence. You know, new new texts that haven't really been in the academic focus before, and also um, <clears throat> work on material culture, including your own um, work, of course, on on uh, sculptural representations of yoga postures in Hampi and other places. Um, that have really, I think, moved on our understanding of of that that history um within um within india and, and south asia more generally um the work uh, maybe you know ad addressing the the work that i did with with jim on on um roots of yoga this compilation of um practice material from primary sources you know i, I think we had a, a 112 or something texts that we sort of exploded mm -hmm. and grouped according to um you know according to their descriptions of particular practices was was really great to see a kind of emerge a, a sort of archaeology of practice and since we're talking about asana um today you know the the that chapter on asana i think shows it quite clearly that mm -hmm. you have a development of asana um in the pre-modern period that's that's quite clear from those very early um seated postures in in patanjali let's say in the in the patanjali yoga shastra where i think there's 13 or 14 of them they're all seated postures you, you're just supposed to sit down um through that you know that the, the, the hatha yoga um revolution you might say where at the beginning of hatha yoga also most of those early texts only describe one or two or three postures and that you know they, they include usually siddhasana padmasana those those seated postures mm -hmm. but then we see something else happening as uh, and, and this this is really the um you know a, a lot of this is about the work that's that's been done by my colleagues on on the hatha yoga project that's to say jim jason and daniela who i know have, have, have featured um in in this podcast mm, um and what what they've shown, and you know, with my my um, small contribution within that, is that the, there was in fact a a kind of um, um, proliferation of asanas, to use Jason's term, after in, from sort of the 17th 18th century onwards. So we start to see um, more of an interest in asanas in the texts, possibly I think as a result of hatha yoga from being a fringe practice being absorbed into the sort of um, um, into a more mainstream uh, culture, let's say, or, or more focus mm -hmm. on on uh, certain practices of hatha yoga, including including asana. So within the textual record, we can see that there is a development, um, you know, w within this history of asana. And we, you know, we're looking we're, some of the additions that we're putting out, um, uh, like the the Yoga Chintamani, and perhaps also the, you know the Hatha Vyasa Padati, which we can talk about yeah. if if you like, um, show clearly that there's something else going on. So that picture was absent from Yoga Body, and in fact, um, the, I think it's the first chapter of Yoga Body where I talk about yoga history and the, the Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads and and so on. I, I think it reflects a. a you know, you can see from now, having done all that work with with their uh, roots of yoga and, and the Hatha Yoga project, your own work and the work of other scholars, um, that the, there's much more to say. There's much more that could come before that, mm. um, and that would inform, in fact, you know, and and provide additional context to that um, to that modern history. So that's certainly there, and I think it's really it's really wonderful. We, you know, we've come to the end, the official end of the Hatha Yoga project. We've got a little extension. We're still going, you know, sort of writing our writing our um, monographs, our books. Mm. Um, but you know, the the kind of um, the view that we have now, thanks to the work of of all these scholars, um, is is something is something quite different. It seems to me that the um, that cultural history of the modern is still 
incredibly important for understanding where we are today because as i say you know the, the sort of the cultural meaning that 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 is with that accrues to these practices or, or that that is sort of embodied in these practices that um that creates a kind of tradition that we've inherited today so um so yes it that that's a kind of context that um that really amplifies the you know that the history that i started that i started out with um sort of well i suppose studying you know 15 or 16 years ago yeah i i really agree with all of that i think uh, although our knowledge of the pre-modern and early modern has expanded considerably and we just know so much more than we did 10 years ago it doesn't change uh, or, 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 or in some challenge, I think the central thesis of, of your work of yoga body, whereas there's still something quite new and modern that happens in the, you know, 19th and 20th, and certainly in the 21st centuries that that help to explain why yoga is, and does, you know, what what it does today, why we think about yoga, uh, in the ways that we do, um, mm -hmm. that still are quite remarkably distinct from the ways in which yoga is articulated uh, in, in the pre-modern, even if there is much more asana, let's say, than previously accounted for. You, you mentioned the Hatha Vyasa Parati, and I do want to ask you about that because it is one of the really interesting, I think, gems of the Hatha Yoga project, um, and that in some ways is a really great example to highlight uh, the richness of uh, the tradition, we might say, on the cusp of modernity or, or uh, on the cusp of the colonial period. I think you guys have dated the Hatha Vyasa Parati to the 18th century. Uh, I know this is a text you've worked on really closely with Jason Birch, and you've recently published an article in the Journal of Yoga Studies um, demonstrating some of your, your key findings, summarizing what you've what you've done with this text. Tell us just a little bit about it and why it's significant, and then also, if we can, maybe briefly, just connect this to Krishnamacharya's yoga and whether or not you think he was aware of this text. Sure. So yes, I, I think probably a late 18th century um, text that from um, from Maharashtra, from uh, sort of the Pune area of, of India, and it's um, we think it's called the Hatabhyasa Padati. It appears to be called that. The text appears to sort of name itself like that. But of course, it's a it's a general name, you know, sort of an instruction book on the practice of Hatha. It's not not a very uh, sort of, you know, it's a it's a fairly generic name. Mm -hmm. But anyway, this this text has um, a range of um, practices that it describes. It's not clear that the um, single manuscript that initially we were working with was a complete text and there's no colophon that you know that this sort of end end point of a of a text that says what usually where it's where it's composed and when it's composed and so on and who it's composed by we don't have that um, but late 18th century describes a range of hatha practices including some very interesting details on how to construct the yogi's hut and you need several huts for, for different practices, some of which need, need a great height, some of which are, are smaller. We have some very unique, um, really unique details on some of the more arcane practices of Hatha Yoga, like um, Vajraoli Mudra. Mm. Um, and, you know, lo lots of, lots of re quite fascinating elements, but possibly what's most interesting about the text is the asana section. Um, where it describes um, a, a, a large number of a large number of postures that are divided, it appears into six blocks, which may be six sequences. That's sort of a, an argument that that we consider at great length in in that article. You know whether or not these groupings of postures, which are you know for example prone postures or postures beginning from a prone position, supine postures or beginning from a supine position, you know, standing postures and so on. Um, whether these are just um, groupings of postures or whether they are intended to be performed as a sequence, all right? If they are, and there's some strong evidence to suggest that at least in part, they are intended to be um, performed as a sequence. It's sort of the first time that we see this happening and the only time we see this happening before sort of, um, 
modern sequential uh, yoga practices. Okay, so it's really quite a, a landmark. Um, we also see a large number of very unusual postures that don't occur anywhere else, mm. um, suggesting that it comes from another stream of yoga practice. Um, you know, it's that that we weren't until that point aware of, and some dynamic postures as well, so, such as jumping up and down, uh, standing on one leg and holding the big toe and, and spinning around, mm. um, and practices that are actually quite hard. So um, we we did a, a, a sort of a research that, that we coined embodied philology, philology being the study of text. We sort of, we, we got practitioners in to perform these, uh, these groups of postures. And it's extremely challenging. It's a really, really hard thing to do. You, you know, you can't simply start at the beginning as, as an untrained or, you know, a, 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 for most people, I think it would be impossible really without an immense amount of practice to to accomplish all, all of these um all of these postures yeah, we, in, had, in we, a, had ruth, row. we had ruth westaby on recently uh, yeah. telling us about mm -hmm. her experience as one of the the practice uh subjects let's say of of this embodied philology and uh ruth is an extra extraordinarily strong and flexible and able-bodied practitioner he was saying you know how, how difficult uh the sequences are Yes, yes. And, you know, Ruth as a, as a long term advanced um, Ashtanga practitioner. Yeah, some of these things are, are just very challenging indeed. So that's really interesting from the point of view of, of um, the, uh, the practice of yoga and what it means. Why would you do such things that, that are so intensely physical when, for instance, in the, in the Hatha Pradivika, one of the counterindications of um, yoga practice is that it shouldn't, you shouldn't be overexerting yourself. Well, you, you sort of have to in, in, in this text. You know, it's kind of, it points towards a different kind of culture, um, which perhaps is, a, you know, is associated with, with um, you know, phys physical culture disciplines from outside of yoga. Perhaps what's going on is a kind of osmosis between other traditions of, of perhaps military training um, or, you know, um, uh, other, other kinds of body discipline that, that are being assimilated into yoga. And of, of course, um, this is something that, that we see um, not just in asana, but but in sort of shat karmas within within mudra. We see a kind of a, assimilation of other things within to the fold of yoga o over this period, and perhaps that's what's happening here. So anyway, um, w it's a it's a fascinating text. Um, I'd, I'd um, recommend you know ha having a look at the article and also having a look at the uh at, at the website i think it's um mm -hmm. um and there'll, there'll be a there'll be a film um we, we've already you know the, there's there's a film of of this sort of experiment of the performance of the asanas yeah we're gonna, we're gonna have jacqueline hargreaves on here soon uh who who's behind the making of the film right and uh yeah. we'll we'll be able to talk in in more detail about that and look really looking forward uh to that debut Absolutely, absolutely. And another reason, though, and I, I mentioned this, that this perhaps is significant, is because there does seem to be a, a highly likely probability that that Krishnamacharya was aware of some some version of this manuscript. Is that right? That's right. The um, the text, the Hatabhyata Padati, a version of it, seems to have been at the basis of a of a book called the Sri Tattva Nidhi, uh, um, or at least a section of the Sri Tattva Nidhi dealing with um, asanas, which was written about in um, the yoga tradition of the Mysore Palace, a book by Norman Shoman. Mm. Um, <clears throat> but also, uh, and also, you know, uh, another another kind of recent discovery that there is there is a manuscript of the Hatabhyasa Padati within the Mysore Library, or at least there used to be. Yeah. And I, I think we can be pretty sure. Uh, well, we know that Krishna Macharya was um, aware of the Sri Tattva Niti because he lists it as one of his sources in his 1934 book, the Yoga Makaranda. So he knew about it, um, but. In um, a, a, a later book, 
Yoga Sunagalu, he, he mentions this um, Yoga Korunta or Yoga Korunti, I think he calls it in, in that book, which of course is this legendary text um, that's often evoked but has never been seen, um, which is supposedly the origin and the source of the practices of Ashtanga Yoga, Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga. So I'm not talking about Patanjali, I'm talking about the um, the yoga of, of Patavi Joyce, Krishna Machari student Patavi Joyce. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's quite possible that Krishna Macharya knew about this book because the um, the author of the Hatha Vyasa um, is is called appears to be called Kapala Koruntaka. So one of the things that that, that I uh, an idea that I'm, I I played with over the course of this article and you know the the edition that's coming out is that um, actually that this um, Kapala Koruntaka this or rather the Yoga Korunta is a reference to um, to the author of this text and that the, this text the Yoga Korunta is in fact the Hatha Vyasa Padati and if you if you read the article you, you'll see our uh, um, considered assessment of, 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 that, uh, of, of that claim. And I think it's probably true that Krishnamacharya um, took inspiration both from the Sri Tattva Niti and from this other text, perhaps in the construction of his sequences. However, unfortunately, it's not, it's not the answer to, to, the, to the conundrum. It seems to me that the, the evidence suggests that although Krishnamacharya was drawing on, on many different sources and may have, may have per perhaps derived a kind of shastric authorization for postural sequences um, from, from this particular text. It's, I, I don't think in any way we, we can identify uh, the Hatha Vyasa Padati with the Yoga Kurunta, unfortunately. That, that would have been very, very exciting indeed. Mm. Um, but that nevertheless, it sort of does have a part to play within, within Krishnamacharya's formulation of yoga. So it's a kind of tentative conclusion, but you know, quite an ex exciting sort of piece of the puzzle, I think, in terms of, uh, in terms of the history of modern yoga. Definitely. And uh, you're, you've been editing and translating with Jason uh, the Hatabhyasa Padati. Is it in its entirety or is it uh, maybe sections of the text? Or t uh, and is that something that folks can expect to, to, to read a publication of in, in, in English translation sometime soon? Yes, 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 it's ready. In fact, it's the, I think it's the first of the, of the 10 critical editions that we finished. So it's actually all done. We've written the introduction and the translation is there. And I'm not sure exactly when it's coming out, out but it, it'll be published with the EFEO um, in, in Pondicherry, uh, so hopefully sometime next year. I'm not exactly sure, but uh, yeah, it's, it's ready, it's done, and it's on its way. And Jim had mentioned that you guys are going to have, um, uh, what is it, op open source or uh, open access editions that will be able to be freely downloaded? Is that still true? Yeah. That's right. Yeah, that's one of the conditions of the um, of the ERC, the European Research mm. Council's grant that we got for five years. So it's, uh, all all this material would be freely available. Wow! So you, you can download it as a PDF. Yeah, that's incredible. Well, I know um, our time is is uh, winding down here. Um, I have so many other questions to ask you about uh, so many different directions, but I'm going to restrain myself. Uh, but I do want to just ask you briefly here about what you're currently working on. You mentioned the monograph, the book that you're writing for the project. Uh, you've got an extension here to, to finish that. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you've been up to in addition to working on some of the additions like the Hatabhyasa Parati. What's, what's the, the current Mark Singleton project? Yeah, the book is about uh, yoga in relationship to technology. And it's, um, you know, if, if, the, the work in Roots of Yoga was about the sort of the, the deep past of yoga, let's say, and, and, um, and then Yoga Body, the sort of the, the emergence of a modern yoga. What I, what I wanted to look at in this book is um, the embrace of technology within yoga over the last um, 10 years or so and the ongoing encounter of yoga with with uh, technology i'm looking at this in in um, on several different levels one is a sort of um ethnography you might say of um of yoga in relation to technology how um sort of 
I'm going to call them banal technologies, um, sort of, you know, the ordin what are now ordinary technologies of yoga are starting to influence the way people practice and the understanding of practice. So things like um, uh, sensor yoga mats and um, wearables that, that can actually tell you how to practice yoga in, in, uh, in conjunction with an app on your phone. Um, I'm, I'm, so, uh, you know, on that level, I'm interested in the kind of tracking process in, in the kind of linking of the human to the machine in order to practice yoga. It seems to me that that's not entirely new. We've seen that throughout, you know, throughout the modern history of yoga, people getting linked up to machines. Um, but the, this is part and parcel of something like a new religion of data. And it's sort of, it seems to me a, another little turn or a major turn perhaps in this history of yoga where we are becoming something like a cyborg, we're, we're, becoming, we're becoming part machine. And I'm, I'm not the first to make this argument, but I, I think, you know, in the context of yoga, it's quite interesting. So um, on the one hand, you have things like that. You have, you know, ways to map um, your, your practice. You have ways to map your brain waves through, you know, sort of headsets and th these meditation headsets have been well studied already. Um, you're also seeing, um, uh, technologies which not which don't just reflect back to you your own experience and track it, but um, technologies that claim to be able to adjust your experience. So headsets that can actually change your brainwaves, that can change the way you experience reality. Mm -hmm. Much like perhaps, and this this is the open question in the book. Um, much like yogis, mm -hmm. you know. And so the question is, you know at this point, is there a philosophical compatibility with the use of technology in order to attain yogic states of awareness, um, states of bliss, and so on, and, um, you know, the, the, the traditional yoga sadhana. So I'm, I'm looking at things like that, uh, like biohacking as well, and th those sort of cultures within yoga, which seem to me um, still quite niche, but sort of on their way, and, and very much sort of entering, uh, entering into yoga. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a very quick sort of uh, overview of, of, um, of, of what I'm doing. Look, I'm looking at sort of the neo-hypermodernism of yoga, to, to borrow a phrase from, from Bruno Latour. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah, I mean, if we think of yoga over the centuries at its core as a discipline for controlling, manipulating, um, and mastering the mind and the body, changing states of consciousness... In that way, it's very much like a technology, a technology of the self, right? To quote Foucault. Uh, this this sounds like a fascinating project. I'm I'm excited to see where you go with it. Um, it brings so much of uh, very timely, current, and even futuristic discourses uh, to to bear with yoga. And I understand this is something you'll be talking about in the upcoming Yogic Studies course. Is that right? I think in Module 4, you'll maybe be sharing some of this with us as we think about the future of yoga. That's exactly right. Yes. Yeah. And so, you know, the, the fourth module is, is sort of new directions, you know, what, what it is, what's going to, what's happening now. Uh, you know, we, we, we appear to be in a, a moment of, of such rapid and major transition in the world, you know, from climate change to COVID to the, the massive growth of technology. This is, this is what I'd, I'd like to focus on in, in, in that final module. Definitely. Well, fantastic. Um, Mark, I mean, thank you so much for just taking the time here with me. I could go on and on for hours, honestly, uh, but it's been a real pleasure to hear more about your story, your, your uh, truly pioneering scholarship. Um, and I, I have to share with our listeners, you've, you've recently announced uh, that you'll be retiring from the, from the field of, of yoga studies and, and doing this type of scholarship which I have to say is uh, is really a great loss uh, for the field. Uh, uh, you're really just a, an incredible thinker and, and scholar pushing the field forward. So uh, I'm, I'm glad you're going to at least put out this last book. I'm incredibly grateful you're going to teach this uh, upcoming online course for us. But on the other side, uh, uh, congratulations uh, on uh, on your retirement. 
Thanks very much, Seth. You know, I'm, I'm retiring in one way, but but not in an, in another. You know, life, life goes on, and it's you know it's it's been really uh, you know an, an incredible privilege to to be working in in this field, and and also you know a, a, a real joy and a real joy to be to be able to take part in these conversations. So so thanks to you, and um, I, you know I greatly look forward to uh, to uh, teaching this course. Yeah, well, I hope I hope you'll continue the conversations, and you'll be a you know a forever emeritus <laughs> to the field. <laughs> and, uh, um, yeah, really. Uh, again, thanks for the conversation. We look forward to the course, which begins on January fourth. We're going to start off the future, twenty twenty one, the new year, with thinking about yoga's past, present, and future with Mark Singleton. So. Um, yeah. Thanks again, Mark. Uh, please take care, be safe, and uh, we'll be in touch very soon, okay? Thanks very much, Seth. I look forward to it. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Yogic Studies Podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes or sharing this episode with someone else. Thanks so much, everyone. Until next time, please take care.